Good evening. Welcome to the 2024 McDermott Lecture presented by the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library featuring Dr. Anne Margaret Daniel. I'm Elaine Hopkins. I am the Senior Director of Programs and Services for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. And we're so grateful to have everyone in the room here in St. Paul and those of us who are joining online from many places. We don't even know how broadly this lecture is being um, viewed across the country and maybe more. So we are, as I said, from the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which supports the library through fundraising, advocacy, and programming. And with that programming, we are also the Library of Congress designated Minnesota Center for the Book. And as such, we present programming that lifts up Minnesota's literary legacy. This made us an excellent fit for programs previously under the umbrella of Fitzgerald in St. Paul organization, which we adopted into our suite of programs in 2020. The McDermott Lecture is named for Richard P. McDermott, who helped restore Fitzgerald's birthplace in the 1970s and remained an avid supporter of Fitzgerald activities before passing away in 2012. As we approach the 100th anniversary of the publication of The Great Gatsby, we thought the McDermott Lecture was a perfect opportunity to preview the coming year's attractions and the slate of exciting programs that we are calling Gatsby at 100, Revisiting Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Our featured speaker tonight was happy to kick us off with that series. I am so pleased to be able to introduce you to Dr. Anne Margaret Daniel. Dr. Daniel teaches at the New School University in New York City. She has degrees in American history and English literature and has published widely on F. Scott Fitzgerald and the work of Bob Dylan. Daniel's edition of Olivia Shakespeare's forgotten fin de siècle novella, Beauty's Hour, a Fantasy, was published by Valancourt in 2015. And her best-selling edition of the last complete stories of F. Scott Fitzgerald, I'd Die for You and Other Lost Stories, was published by Scribner, Simon & Schuster in 2017. Her edition of The Great Gatsby was published by W.W. W. Norton in 2022, and her second edition of Oxford's World Classic Tales of the Jazz Age in 2023. After finding a complete copy of Owen Davis's 1926 Broadway play script of The Great Gatsby in the library at Colorado State University, she edited it with James L. W. West III, and The Great Gatsby, the 1926 Broadway script, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2024. So, folks, we have an F. Scott Fitzgerald expert on our hands. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel. Thank you, Elaine, for that very generous introduction and sincerest thanks to the Friends of the Library for their kind invitation to come to F. Scott Fitzgerald's birthplace on his 128th birthday, which is today. Thanks to Elaine and to Mark Taylor for a convivial day out in the sun on a lovely day in St. Paul. It's too many years since the Fitzgerald Society held our uh, meeting here back in 2017 when I met some of you, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in St. Paul on such a special day. Special, too, as we look ahead to 2025 and the 100th anniversary of the publication of The Great Gatsby, which was brought out by Scribner in New York City on April 13th of that year. Your math is correct. Fitzgerald finished Gatsby, though he continued revising it even after its publication when he was just 28 years old. He was 25 in the spring of 1922 when he wrote to Max Perkins, his great editor at Scribner, quote, I'm thinking of starting a new novel this summer. Fitzgerald was writing to Perkins from St. Paul. <clears throat> After a hectic and headline-making couple of years in and around New York City, Scott and Zelda Sayre Fitzgerald had moved back here in August of 1921. They rented a house first in Delwood on the shores of White Bear Lake. If we could have the first slide, that would be lovely. Thank you. And thanks to eBay for the image. <laughs> um, the house they rented was owned by the Thompson family, 
and brought to the Fitzgerald's attention by their dear friends, C.O. and Zandra Kalman, Callie and Sandy, they called them, who had a place nearby. Scott's parents, of course, had been living here since 1908. Zelda was just 21 in the spring of 1922, and a new mother, their baby daughter, Frances Scott, nicknamed Scotty, though Zelda had wanted to call her Patricia, was born in the Miller Hospital in October of 1921. If we could have the second slide, please. Fitzgerald was already a popular novelist and writer of short stories, and he was determined that this new novel, which would be his third, would keep that popularity and good income going. After a brutally cold winter, even for St. Paul, the summer of 1922 was hot with temperatures reaching a remarkable 100 degrees by June. Fitzgerald and his family moved from 626 Goodrich Avenue back out to White Bear Lake and he began to write in earnest. Back in their first summer here, 1921, Fitzgerald had already sent The Beautiful and Damned out to his publisher. It was serialized in Metropolitan Magazine that autumn before Scribner brought it out as a book. And he was already wondering rather bleakly about that third novel. That August, he wrote to Perkins, quote, my third novel, if I ever write another, will I'm sure be black as death with gloom. I should like to sit down with a half dozen chosen companions and drink myself to death. But I am sick alike of life, literature, and liquor. If it wasn't for Zelda, I think I'd disappear out of sight for three years, ship as a sailor or something, and get hard. I'm sick of the flabby, semi-intellectual softness in which I flounder with my generation. A year later, looking out at the waters of that same beautiful lake and beginning the intense thought process of realizing a story full of death and gloom and also great beauty and romance, which are his natural modes after all, Fitzgerald finally got started on that third novel. Now, This Side of Paradise, his first novel in 1920, had been a runaway bestseller. And Fitzgerald quickly followed it with that host of popular short stories and The Beautiful and Damned. Like James Joyce, a writer he much admired, Fitzgerald liked to set his novels in the circumstances of his own life in the very immediate past for him. Paradise is set principally at Princeton University, um, where Fitzgerald was an undergraduate from 1913 to 1917. The Beautiful and Damned is set in and around New York City and features a wildly social young couple, rather like Scott and Zelda. Now, he had no intention initially of revealing too much too soon about this third novel while it was still in its formative stages. And what he did reveal changed greatly as he wrote and then revised. This is the original plan he outlined for what would become Gatsby. Quote, its locale will be the Middle West, and New York of 1885, I think. It will concern less superlative beauties than I run to usually, and will be centered on a smaller period of time. It will have a Catholic element. A month later, his imagination glowing, Fitzgerald had found, if not the entirety of his subject and characters, his style. Quote, I want to write something new, and he underlined that new, something extraordinary and beautiful and simple and intricately patterned. So all this in a nutshell was Fitzgerald's original game plan for what would become The Great Gatsby, a Midwestern novel with portions set in New York, transpiring in the decade before Fitzgerald himself was born, and to do somehow with Catholicism. Fitzgerald, as most of you surely know, had been raised Catholic by a devout mother, and he had attended the Newman School, a Catholic prep school in Hackensack, New Jersey, where the headmaster, Father Sigourney Fay, became his first mentor. However, what he called the Catholic element 
and also his desire to set the novel in the late 1800s and the world of his boyhood fell away when the Fitzgeralds moved back east in the fall of 1922. They rented a house in Great Neck, Long Island, and Fitzgerald's new beautiful and extraordinary novel shifted its scene accordingly. Fitzgerald was dazzled and distracted by both the proximity of New York and in Great Neck by what Nick Carraway calls the consoling proximity of millionaires. It was hard for a young writer who liked a good party to work, living in a community full of celebrities, from other writers like Ring Lardner to Broadway actors and producers and the makers and stars of the relatively new but already sensationally popular moving pictures. Fitzgerald tried at first to work constantly and seriously on his novel in a sparsely furnished study above the garage that held just a desk, a chair with his favorite old ratty wool v-neck golf sweater over the back, a lamp, and a cast iron stove. And this would be typical for him, his study spaces, his writing spaces, in all the houses he maintained in the future were very Spartan. If we could have the next slide, please, of him at work, wearing that golf sweater. Um, quote, Scott has started a new novel and retired into strict seclusion and celibacy, Zelda wrote to Sandy Kalman back here in St. Paul. However, Fitzgerald got sidetracked by the idea of a satirical political play called The Vegetable. The play had the same theme as his novel in progress, a poor boy wanting to become rich, an influential man by any means available, thereby winning the love of a wealthy girl. Fitzgerald also wanted badly to have a hit play on Broadway, like so many of his great neck neighbors. The novel slipped to a back burner as the Fitzgeralds partied and he focused on the play. He was still writing short stories too to pay their immediate bills. Several of them are rough drafts for portions of Gatsby. At Christmas time, 1922, Winter Dreams appeared in Metropolitan Magazine. Regarded today as one of Fitzgerald's finest and surely one of his most anthologized stories, Winter Dreams is about a golf club caddy who makes good and is in love with a golden girl. Fitzgerald referred to it directly as, quote, a sort of first draft of the Gatsby idea. Paragraphs and phrases from the story would wend their way into Gatsby. Um, as would moments from some of his other contemporary stories, among them Dice, Brass Knuckles, and Guitar, Diamond Dick, and above all, The Sensible Thing. The last of these uh, is about a southern belle named Jonquil, not Daisy, but Jonquil, um, Jonquil Carey, and a poor young man who's in the advertising business, which was Fitzgerald's first job in New York back in 1919. Um, he loves her, but he can't afford her. The sensible thing really feels like a draft of Jay Gatsby's days courting Daisy Fay when he's a young lieutenant in the army. If you know it or when you read it, you'll see in the elegiac ending to the third section of The Sensible Thing, a deep kinship from that flashback in chapter eight of Gatsby when Gatsby returned from Europe, revisits Louisville um, months after Tom and Daisy's wedding. In the Fitzgerald papers at Princeton, you can literally see where Fitzgerald took these published stories and found things in them to reuse in Gatsby. Uh, clipped from the magazines where they had appeared, they bear the markings of his customary number two pencil, things he thought worthy of reusing or recycling or circled, and what was now weak to him, he crosses out. At the top of a story, Fitzgerald would often write the noir sounding phrase stripped and permanently buried are sometimes not to be reprinted. The best stories he was writing in 1922, 23, 24 were testing grounds and also quarries for Gatsby. Now, his play, The Vegetable, into which he put so much energy working instead of working on Gatsby in 22 and 23, did not make it to Broadway. Upon its premiere in Atlantic City, New Jersey, 
in the autumn of 1923, it was a tremendous failure. As Zelda said, quote, it flopped as flat as one of Aunt Jemima's famous pancakes. Saddened and also humbled by the reception of the vegetable, Fitzgerald turned back to his novel almost immediately and with a renewed determination. He had a first working draft almost complete by late 1923. However, he didn't like it. And in the spring of 1924, he began not just to revise, but flat out rewrite. He confessed to Perkins in April of 24 that much of what, quote, I wrote last summer was good, but it was so interrupted that it was ragged. And in approaching it from a new angle, I've had to discard a lot of it. In one case, 18,000 words, part of which will appear in the Mercury as a short story, close quote. That discarded portion of Gatsby did indeed appear in H.L. Mencken's magazine, The American Mercury, uh, in June of 1924, under the title Absolution. Fitzgerald later said that Absolution was to have been the prologue of Gatsby, but, quote, it interfered with the neatness of the plan. Absolution is a story of a beautiful, intense little boy of 11 named Rudolf Miller, who is forced to go to confession with a priest by his brutal father. Rudolf imagines a new background and a fancy name for himself, Blatchford Sarnamington. Don't ask me where it came from. Um, he imagines this for himself to escape his current existence. And the priest has a spectacular breakdown uh, near the end that offended Catholic readers of absolution. Publishing this shard of the earliest draft of Gatsby got rid of many elements from that initial idea Fitzgerald had had for a novel set in the Midwest with a Catholic element. What Fitzgerald had foremost in mind now and increasingly was this new writing style he was attempting and the desire to achieve something truly even radically new in terms of fiction. Quote, I'm thrown directly on purely creative work, not trashy imaginings as in my stories, but the sustained imagination of a sincere and yet radiant world. So I tread slowly and carefully and at times in considerable distress. This book will be a consciously artistic achievement and must depend on that as the first books did not." Close quote. As he jettisoned bits of his drafts along the way, Gatsby was taking shape as we know it today. Fitzgerald was finally writing swiftly and really well when he, Zelda, and Scotty moved to France in May of 1924. They thought they would have more privacy, spend less money, and that he would have the time for uninterrupted work if they moved to the Riviera. Um, after a fairly unproductive stint after they first arrived in a hotel in Hier, uh, he always had trouble writing in hotels. They rented the Villa Marie in Saint Raphael. There, Scott settled into something of a routine. Quote, we are idyllically settled here and the novel is going fine. It ought to be done in a month. He exulted to Perkins in 1924. Gatsby was not done in a month. Even as Fitzgerald was writing to Perkins that June, Zelda was meeting a French aviator named Edouard Josin. She began an intense flirtation with him, more than her flirtations with their mutual friends in New York and worshipers of hers like the editor George Jean Nathan. Her relationship with Josin was deeply upsetting to Fitzgerald. And to add to all the chaos, the Riviera was, of course, filling up during summertime and early fall with rich Americans passing through, parties, events to go to. Work became both an escape and all the more of a challenge. Fitzgerald persevered, though, and he had a manuscript ready for typists by September. In the ledger that he kept for most of his life and in which he entered his writing sold as well as life events, Fitzgerald noted, quote, the novel finished for September of 1924. Again, it was not finished. He really wanted it to be perfect. 
October was full of revisions of the typescript. In his ledger, Fitzgerald remarked that he was, quote, working at high pressure to finish. The manuscript of The Great Gatsby, preserved by Fitzgerald himself and given to the Princeton University Library by Scotty, is a collection of at least two and probably three drafts from different times. Of the very earliest draft from 1923, only two pages survive, and this because Fitzgerald mailed them to Willa Cather. <clears throat> he was afraid that Cather, who was America's, I, I'd say she was America's most celebrated novel of the Midwest at the time, celebrated novelist of the Midwest at the time, it, he was afraid that she would think he had plagiarized a description of Daisy from that of the heroine in Cather's 1923 novel, A Lost Lady. Um, to prove that he hadn't, because there weren't any time-stamped emails or anything like that, Fitzgerald sent the pages to her with a, with a covering letter as proof that he hadn't stolen her description. Um, and Cather wrote back very graciously to say, no, she believed him, and she's really looking forward to reading his novel, you know, this kind of thing. Um, on those pages, Daisy Buchanan is called Ada, Jordan Baker is Jordan Vance, and the narrative is in the third person, rather than the first person point of view of Nick Carraway, who was once called Dudley instead of Nick, and nicknamed Dud. And that's the, that's the handout that you have that I've given to you. They're the only two pages we know of from the earliest draft of Gatsby. You can peruse them at your leisure. You'll recognize the passage, of course, the description of Daisy with sad, lovely things, etc., cetera, um, from early in the novel. Now, Fitzgerald had settled by spring of 1924 on Carraway as his narrator telling most of the story in a present tense or in flashbacks that were woven so seamlessly as not to be jarring to readers. And this was the new style, his very own stream of consciousness that Fitzgerald was attempting, um, influenced certainly by Joyce, uh, influenced by some of the other modernist writers, but developing his own style. Jay Gatsby, or Jimmy Gatz, was the mystery man. Daisy Faye Buchanan, the almost ephemeral but deeply self-centered socialite. Jordan Vance, now Jordan Baker, a golfer who sometimes succeeds by cheating. Tom Buchanan, the supremely wealthy and supremely bigoted former college athlete. George and Myrtle Wilson, the impoverished owners of a gas station in Queens. And a host of minor characters, party guests, that really actually rival the numbers in a longer kind of Victorian novel, something by Charles Dickens or by Thackeray. Um, they were in place now and getting fleshed out. Now, the typescripts that were prepared by typists in France and doubtless revised by Fitzgerald are lost. When Fitzgerald notified his literary agent, Harold Ober, in November 1924 that he was sending, quote, the manuscript of my new novel uh, to Scribner, he meant that he was sending copies of the typescripts, which are originals from the author and viewed as manuscript at the time. Um, by November, Perkins had read the whole thing and was both pleased and astounded by how good it was. One thing Perkins was able right away to describe perfectly was the style that Fitzgerald had been laboring over. Quote, you adopted exactly the right method of telling it, that of employing a narrator who is more of a spectator than an actor. That puts the reader upon a point of higher observation on a higher level than that on which the characters stand. In no other way could your irony have been so immensely effective, nor the reader have been enabled so strongly to feel the strangeness of human circumstance in a vast, heedless universe. Perkins did offer some suggestions and changes, uh, including changes to that section set in the Plaza Hotel, which Fitzgerald revised and revised over and over again. At one point, he, he couldn't decide 
how to get all the characters to go into New York. At one point, he had them all go to a baseball game at the polo grounds. In a manuscript section, there's a fantastic description of, of the baseball game and the peanuts and the sound of the crowd and even the kind of pitches that the pitcher is throwing. I, I sort of wish that that had survived into the novel, but it didn't. Um, and uh, Perkins did offer some suggestions about the plaza and concluded by saying, you once told me that you were not a natural writer. My God, you have plainly mastered this craft, but you needed far more than craftsmanship for this. Fitzgerald was happy with the praise. He relied on Perkins, as you know, pretty heavily for uh, not only suggestions about his writing, for affirmation, and in later years for money as well, for advances from Scribner that kept him going during his Hollywood years. But he continued to fret constantly over the details of a, quote, finished, unquote, novel. In Rome for Christmas time, he continued to work straight through the holidays. Quote, he wrote to Perkins, quote, with the age you've given me, I can make Gatsby perfect. The chapter eight, the hotel scene, will never be quite up to the mark. I've worried about it too long, and I can't quite place Daisy's reaction, but I can improve it a lot. I just have to, I've cut a bit here, I must get all these characters to New York in order to have the catastrophe on the road going back. And I must have it pretty much that way. So there's no chance of bringing freshness to it. Close quote. Perkins had felt that the character of Gatsby himself was too vague, and Fitzgerald was too polite to say this is the point. <laughs> he just wrote back, quote, strange to say my notion of Gatsby's vagueness is okay. He knew Gatsby at that point, he said only half jokingly, better than he knew Scotty. Um, he had obliged Zelda to draw pictures of Gatsby, what she thought Gatsby looked like over and over and over again. I wish those survived. I haven't been able to find them, but maybe they're still out there in family hands. I hope so. The long, thin galley proofs that Scribner returned to Fitzgerald in autumn of 1924 are a remarkable sight today. They exist, and they still bear one of his working titles for the novel, Trimalchio the name of a former Roman slave flaunting his new wealth in Petronius's Satyricon. Um, one set at the University of South Carolina in the Broccoli Collection is unmarked. The other at Princeton has his handwriting, Fitzgerald's handwriting, all over every page with additions, deletions, co corrections, inserts, and messages to the printer that some, sometimes got jumbled up and put into the text and then had to be removed. Um, this, this edition of Trimalchio uh, is published in a nice affordable paperback in the Magisterial Cambridge edition of Fitzgerald, edited by Jim West, uh, the dean of all Fitzgerald scholars. And reading it in comparison to the Gatsby we all know and love is something I sincerely recommend. Now, as Fitzgerald and his family were traveling into Italy, through the south of France, through the holidays, and on into the new year, he kept working on the galleys. Even after he had finally sent them in two separate batches, just imagine what that was like for Scribner's. Um, he shipped them over from Rome and from Capri. Uh, he still worried that all his changes would not be made, and he begged Perkins to have someone go through with just a fine-tooth comb, very carefully twice, as he put it, to see that all of his inserts were in correctly. Quote, there are so many of them that I'm in terror of a mistake. He also wanted, quote, no changes whatsoever made in it, except in the case of a misprint so glaring as to be certain, and that only by you, close quote. He was immensely proud of the book. He'd written back in November to a young St. Louis author, a woman named Hazel McCormick, who went by her nickname Patsy, Patsy McCormick. Um, she'd sent him a fan letter, and he began a correspondence with her. He liked what she had to say about his writing, and, and she was kind of a safe place to, 
to say things, to answer things. Um, and to, he told her a little bit about the novel, in some ways more than he'd told Perkins. But he insisted that he couldn't tell her the title. Quote, I've written a novel, Patsby, that's just about the best one written in America for 20 years. It appears in the spring. I'd tell you the name, but I'm going to change it. Amusingly, he kind of did tell her the name. Throughout the letter, Fitzgerald misspells Patsy every time, P-A-T-S-B-Y, Patsby. <laughs> now, the title really bedeviled him. Um, Fitzgerald kept changing it, or trying to, all spring, even after he'd sent in the proofs, even after Zelda had said, look, The Great Gatsby really is the best title. Can we just stick with it? Um, some of the titles he considered were Among the Ash Heaps and Millionaires, Tremalchio, Tremalchio in West Egg, Gold-Hatted Gatsby, then he went back to Tremalchio, and then he sent a telegram to Perkins after the book was in press, announcing that he was, in all capitals, crazy about the title Under the Red, White, and Blue. Perkins said it was too late to change, and happily, that title was left for Grail Marcus's elegant, wide-ranging Under the Red, White, and Blue, patriotism, disenchantment, and the stubborn myth of the great Gatsby, 2020. In his own copy of the first edition, first printing, Fitzgerald made even more changes, including some significant stylistic changes and cuts in whole paragraphs, most of which were incorporated into the second edition. He really was desperate for this book to be perfect. On April 10th, 1925, the eve of Gatsby's publication in New York, Fitzgerald wrote to Perkins from Paris, quote, Dear Max, the book comes out today, and I am overcome with fears and forebodings. Supposing women didn't like the book because it has no important woman in it, and critics didn't like it because it dealt with the rich and contained no peasants borrowed out of Tess in it and set to work in Idaho. I'm sick of the book myself. I wrote it over at least five times, and I still feel that what should be that strong scene in the hotel is hurried and ineffective. It's too bad, because the first five chapters and parts of the seventh and eighth are the best things I've ever done." Close quote. The first printing of Gatsby was of just under 21,000 copies. It sold for $2. It was 218 pages long and was encased in a gorgeous dust jacket by painter and illustrator Francis Cougat, the brother of the celebrated Jazz Age band leader, Xavier Cougat. Fitzgerald loved the painting, which is now preserved at Princeton thanks to Charlie Scribner, who found it behind a bookcase in the old Scribner offices, and he told me that he just brought it home and knew he was gonna give it to the Fitzgerald papers, and one day when he was driving down to Princeton for a football game, he put it in the back of the car and just dropped it off by the library on his way. Um, <laughs> surely you know that original cover that shows a woman's blue eyes, the left having shed one perfect tear, the bottom half of their irises made of small, curving, naked figures, and the red lips floating over an amusement park, Coney Island, lit up at night. Fitzgerald actually wrote to Perkins, quote, for Christ's sake, don't give anyone that jacket you're saving for me. I've written it into the book. If we could have the next slide, please. That is um, from Scribner's in-house, uh, an artist's conception of the blocking for the book that only recently came to light and is now in a private collection in New York. So you can see the, uh, the artist's proof, if you will, that was done from the original painting. Here's Fitzgerald's first description, the first description in the manuscripts of one of Gatsby's best-known symbols. Quote, the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg were large and round and blue, and their retinas were one yard high. They were set in no face, but only in a pair of enormous gilt spectacles, which joined them by a bridge passing over an imaginary nose. 
Evidently, some wild wag of an oculist had set them there to advertise his practice in flushing, and then forgotten them, or sunk to his eternal rest, or moved away. But his eyes remained like Shelley's heart among the ashes, dimmed a little by many paintless years under the sun and rain, and yet somehow the most living thing in sight. He got rid of, among other things, that Shelley's heart among the ashes in his final draft. But I like knowing that it was once there in his imagination, that scene on the beach at Via Reggio, where the drowned body of Percy Shelley was cremated by his friends, including Byron, and his widow Mary took his unburned heart from the ashes and kept it all her life in her desk. It's now buried with her in Bournemouth. Um, Fitzgerald loved all the romantic poets, but Shelley and Keats most of all. Now, an old chestnut about Gatsby is that the critical reviews, the contemporary reviews, were poor. And that's not entirely true. They weren't so bad at all, but some of the first, which were in New York papers, were so obtuse as to be downright cruel. Ruth Hale, writing her always edgy column called The Paper Knife, that tells you what kind of a column it was, in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, had disliked Fitzgerald's earlier novels. She thought him a lightweight, and it seemed like she disliked him too. She complained that she could find neither, quote, magic, life, irony, romance, or mysticism in all of the great Gatsby, and concluded why Fitzgerald should be called an author has never been explained satisfactorily to me. Now, Fitzgerald was sure that she hated the book because of something that had bugged him, too, the absence of a strong female character, which he'd been afraid would, would even offend female readers. He was confident about his abilities, but also, like many writers before and since, he was deeply upset by any poor review, finding comfort where he could after reading Hale's nasty review. Fitzgerald wrote with a despondency still palpable, quote, the jacket was a hit anyhow. <laughs> he was right about that. If you're lucky enough to have a Gatsby, a first edition Gatsby in a dust jacket, um, go ahead and retire now. <laughs> now, smarter reviewers without axes to grind saw more right away. This is from the Boston Globe, quote, the tale sets forth the incongruities of the life of the times, the strangeness of human circumstances in a heedless universe. The Baltimore Evening Sun praised Fitzgerald for creating, quote, an interesting selection of individuals and a wholly realistic and ironic study of the blindingly curious incongruities of a certain phase of the life of our period. Now the word incongruities here is of course an elliptical way of saying the novel is chiefly about social class and wealth. Most of the novel's main characters live in two Long Island communities called East Egg and West Egg, which are loosely based on two real towns, Count Egg and Great Neck. Um, East Eggers are largely people who don't work, have no jobs, and who have inherited money, like Tom and Daisy. While the West Eggers, like Nick Carraway and Jay Gatsby work, even if it's in some kind of unspecified, vague profession. Nick Carraway says he's in the bond business and he has all these books about the bond business. We see him go to his office and sit at his desk, but we really don't see him doing much of anything. And yet, and yet work he does. Um, New York City is the place where both the new Wall Street and illegally gained money from racketeering and gambling is made. And people from the eggs going in and out of the city have to cross that valley of ashes, the wasteland um, of ash heaps being traversed by, by millionaires, where the truly poor people, George Wilson and Myrtle Wilson, um, live and toil. Tom Buchanan, a fantastically wealthy man who's inherited his money and done nothing good since playing football for Yale, is one of the least admirable characters in American literature. He's a bigoted racist, he's a bully, he's lazy and also restless with his unemployment and nothing to do. He's particularly a user of women, 
who, to my mind, preys on so-called lower-class women, the chambermaid in the hotel when he and Daisy are on their honeymoon, who's in a car wreck with him and breaks her arm in the course of the wreck, um, the wife of a man who runs a gas station. A rich man exploiting or a poor woman for sex is hardly a new theme. C.E.G. Pamela, Oliver Twist, Jane Eyre. Um, the relationship between Tom and Myrtle Wilson, which showcases the difference in social standing between the Buchanans and the Wilsons, is, I think, one of Fitzgerald's most intense depictions of what money can do for those who have it and what the lack of it does to those who don't. Young Jimmy Gatz of Minnesota is the walking symbol of this depiction, kind of colliding and manifest in one person. But all of Gatsby's probably ill-gotten, fast-dissolving money, all his Saturday nights full of blue gardens and yellow cocktail music and champagne and dancing under the stars, can't buy him status, happiness, safety, or love. His loss is a loss that any reader, regardless of social status, can feel keenly, though, because we all have illusions. As Fitzgerald wrote to his old Princeton friend, uh, friend Ludlow Fowler, Lud Fowler, quote, that's the whole burden of this novel, the loss of those illusions that give such color to the world so that you don't care whether things are true or false, so long as they partake of the magical glory. Dangerous words, those illusions that color the world so that you don't care if things are true or false. America is still being shaped and shaken by that particular dark facet of the so-called American dream. The Great Gatsby predicts the crash of that bubble world that Nick Carraway's bond business was building in its dark intimations of the party being over in chapters eight and nine. As Wall Street crashed and the depression took over America and the world, the Fitzgerald's lives also turned downward with Zelda's repeated and increasingly lengthy hospitalizations from 1930, and magazines with neither the money nor the desire for dazzling stories about rich people and what they wanted and hoped for. Fitzgerald was delighted when Bennett Cerf agreed to include Gatsby in the New Modern Library in the mid-1930s, and he wrote a new introduction for it that he later abjured, if we could see the next slide. Very bad introduction, that, that's Fitzgerald's writing um, in a copy that surfaced recently and, uh, and was sold at auction. Now, people didn't buy the book and Surf didn't republish it. In March of 1940, Fitzgerald wrote to Zelda, quote, my God, I'm a forgotten man. Gatsby had to be taken out of the modern library because it didn't sell, which was a blow. In 1937, Gatsby was serialized in shortened form and with some terrible typos in newspapers as the Sunday novel in the Rotogravure magazine sections of, among others, the Philly Inquirer, the Chicago Herald and Examiner, and the Detroit Free Press. If we could have the next slide, please. Yeah, that's Daisy and Gatsby, if you can believe it. Um, with drawings of the main characters by book illustrator and landscape artist Harold E. Snyder, this version of Gatsby is in the main a reprint of the first edition, but with some major and jarring omissions for reasons of length um, and sanitizings that were in tune with the cultural and political climate of the spring of 1937. Tom Buchanan does not talk about this man Stoddard and his book at the luncheon party in chapter one. Uh, he doesn't condemn intermarriage between black and white as he did in the Plaza Hotel scene in the original book. Myrtle Wilson is no longer Tom's mistress but is described as his sweetheart. The moment in the apartment where Tom and Myrtle retire to the bedroom and the brutality of her death, particularly the description of the state of her body when the car hits her and 
cuts off one of her breasts and rips the corners of her mouth. Fitzgerald had insisted that this remain in a letter to Perkins. He was adamant that it had to be that rough. Um, those are gone, taken out. Um, the, uh, the mention of the swastika holding company, no more. Young James Gatz's brown hardening body that knows women early, that's gone. Nick Carraway's underwear no longer even climbs his legs like a damp snake. <laughs> that was too much for the censor in 1937. The owl-eyed man at Gatsby's funeral, wiping his glasses, no longer says, poor son of a bitch, but laments instead, poor fellow. <laughs> Most distressingly to me, this bodlerization left out my favorite passage of the novel, which I'm going to read you at the end of this lecture. The colorized illustrations by Snyder are lovely, though the characters being dressed in late 1930s style is somewhat disconcerting. If we could have the next slide. Um, this, is, uh, this is Jordan and Nick on that side at, at one of Gatsby's parties. Jordan looks nothing like a suntanned cadet. And Daisy is a rather matronly looking russet haired woman with those pronounced 1930s eyebrows. Um, Myrtle Wilson has lost all of her surplus flesh, and she's a very slight thing. Uh, Jay Gatsby wears a mustache, I think perhaps because Warner Baxter did in the now lost 1926 movie version of the novel, manages to look rather appropriately very different from illustration to illustration. My favorite illustration of Gatsby in this serialization the next slide, please, is when he and Daisy retreat to Nick's house to sit on the steps at that party she finally goes to. Um, Gatsby looks quite remarkably to me like Marlon Brando would one day. Um, young Marlon was only 12 years old at the time, but doesn't that look like Brando to you? Fitzgerald didn't comment on this serialization, only to wonder if the 25 cent press could keep Gatsby in the public eye. Well, the 25 cent press did not, though surely many people read and reread Gatsby there. When Fitzgerald died in Hollywood far too young in December of 1940, copies of that second edition, as Wikipedia and every critical article on Gatsby will tell you, were indeed resting in a warehouse, unsold. However, within a few years, Fitzgerald's old Princeton friend, the critic and editor Edmund Wilson, who is a year ahead of him at Princeton, class of 1916, saw to it that the novel was included in that slim, rectangular, portable, armed services edition given to soldiers during World War II. 155,000 copies of Gatsby went out in 1945 to troops far from home, fighting across the planet in ancient European cities and on Paradise Island. Servicemen and women read Gatsby and understood keenly then its nostalgia for an America already lost or perhaps never really extant. The book's popularity and also a recognition of its singular Americanness began to rise in 1945 and has yet to decline. Representations in other media have, of course, helped keep Gatsby popular too. Film, stage, and television versions have really abounded. Um, critical reviews and sales did not matter to movie producers who fought during the summer of 1925 over the rights to Gatsby. And they paid Fitzgerald via Ober a good chunk of money for it, too. Now, this first movie, as I've mentioned to you, is, is lost now except for a very engaging trailer. However, Zelda wrote that she and Scott walked out of a screening in Los Angeles in early 1927 because they thought it, quote, rotten and awful and terrible, close quote. The 1926 Broadway version, which opened at the Ambassador Theater, was quite different from the novel plot-wise, but it was fast-paced and successful thanks to the already Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Owen Davis. Fitzgerald was in Europe when it premiered, and he wrote eagerly to Perkins and Harold Ober, quote, tell me all about my play. If we could have the next slide. 
spoiler. Um, finally, he had a Broadway hit, even though it was adapted by someone else's pen. Perkins disliked the play's prologue, which is set in Louisville when Jay Gatsby is a young officer heading off to war, and Tom Buchanan, who's also serving in the army, which he notably does not in the novel, also appears in that prologue. Um, Davis had to have the love triangle right there at the beginning. Um, but Perkins admitted there were many curtain calls, and James Rennie in the role of Gatsby, here you see him dying in, in the lap of Florence Eldridge, who is, who is Daisy. Um, James Rennie in the role of Gatsby was particularly popular. The Broadway show went on the road after a good run with some script alterations that were evidently to keep from shocking non-Manhattan audiences. Myrtle Wilson lives. I know. Um, the last mention of this traveling production that I can find in newspapers is at the Schubert Theater in January of 1927. In 1939, the Davis version was performed as a successful nationwide radio broadcast that brought Fitzgerald a little much needed money. Now that Jim West and I have dusted off the Broadway script and Cambridge University Press has published it at last, I do hope the Davis play will be produced again. Um, it has a lot of merit. However, for the fullest and most breathtaking stage version of Gatsby there could ever be, come to the Public Theater in New York this autumn and see Gats. The Elevator Repair Service Company have said this will be their final revival of the 2010 production, which features every single word of the novel performed on stage and stars Scott Shepard, who has memorized the entire book, as Nick Carraway. It's on, I think, starting in November and closes December the 1st. Fitzgerald did hope to see a better movie of Gatsby during his own lifetime. One day at the studio where he was working in the summer of 1937, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, Fitzgerald sat down to lunch in the commissary with the studio's biggest male star who was interested in playing Jay Gatsby. Unfortunately for Fitzgerald, Clark Gable was soon cast as Rhett Butler and at work on another movie. Later, after Fitzgerald's death would come the film noir Gatsby with Alan Ladd and Ruth Hussey wasted as a fairly flimsy Jordan Baker. There's also the beautiful Robert Redford vehicle of 1974, which is notable for Redford's smile, um, Ralph Lauren costumes, and for my money, the excellent Karen Black as Myrtle Wilson. Um, then there's Lerman's hyperkinetic 3D version of 2013 with Leonardo DiCaprio that really does capture some of the frenetic energy of the jazz age. Television versions include a 1958 CBS version starring Robert Ryan and Gene Crane and hosted appropriately by Rod Serling. Um, because I say appropriately because it is a creepy version that, as one critic said at the time, is neither great nor Gatsby. <laughs> More recently, very recently indeed, musical versions of Gatsby are proliferating. This is what happens when a book goes out of copyright, as Gatsby did on January the 1st, uh, 2021. In 1999, with the permission of the trustees of the Fitzgerald Estate, John Harbison composed an opera of Gatsby in honor of James Levine's 25th anniversary at the Metropolitan Opera. I saw it. Uh, Dawn Upshaw was wonderful as, as Daisy. It doesn't get revived very much, though. Um, currently, there's a flashy, dashy musical on Broadway, delighting audiences with its strong women characters who have much more stage time and more interesting plot twists that are not remotely in the book. And Gatsby, an American myth, with music by Thomas Bartlett and songs composed by Florence Welch of Florence and the Machine, um, has just been at the American Repertory Theater in Cambridge. It must be preparing even now for Broadway because their website has just been renamed Gatsby B-Way. 
I loved this production, particularly the junkyard uh, automobile scrapyard set. And there were some excellent performances in it, particularly by Celia Pfeiffer as Myrtle. Both these new musicals insist on Myrtle as a mother, which is quite interesting to me. In one, she's pregnant when she dies. In the other, she has had a baby girl who has died because George Wilson couldn't afford a doctor. Every time another Gatsby movie is made or another Gatsby play or musical ensues, it becomes all the more apparent to me, at least, that Fitzgerald's words have already done so much cinematic, dramatic work that the best thing a writer, composer, director, actor can do is just follow them. His language is full of color and light. It constrains a filmmaker terribly. And how do you film those thoughts and feelings that central characters don't articulate openly or even admit to themselves? that are just floating around in their heads. Fitzgerald's words can give these psychological and emotional circumstances shape on the page, but they're really hard to represent visually. This is why dramatists have to resort to digitized computer-generated green lights over rippling Long Island sound waters, loud music and lots of dancing, extra pregnancies, and even more affairs and situations to advance the plot and the like. It's sometimes awful and more often fun to see Gatsby enacted and performed, but it's always wonderful and meaningful and comforting too to just pick it up and start rereading. May we have the last slide, please? Fitzgerald knew how good his novel was and knew, I believe, in his heart that it would endure. As he said of writing Gatsby, quote, both the effort and the result have hardened me, and I think now that I'm much better than any of the young Americans without exception. And he underlined that without exception. He was right. And he would be delighted, but unsurprised, to be here today, hearing us celebrating him and the first century of a book that many people in many countries who have read it in every language under the sun consider to be the great American novel. Gatsby was, when it appeared, and is now, both a reminiscence and a romance, and also a warning, a writing on the wall. Yet what remains, and Nick Carraway was for once entirely correct about something, is that extraordinary gift of hope. Jay Gatsby had it, and the book bearing his name scatters it, even to the elegiac ending. Nick announces his return to come home just before he makes that final trip out to the lawn and beach in front of his and Gatsby's houses. And here is the hope and joy that pours from the book in my favorite passage from the novel. Quote, One of my most vivid memories is of coming back west from prep school and later from college at Christmas time. Those who went farther than Chicago would gather in the old dim Union Station at six o'clock of a December evening with a few Chicago friends already caught up into their own holiday gaieties to bid them a hasty goodbye. I remember the fur coats of the girls returning from Miss This or That's and the chatter of frozen breath and the hands waving overhead as we caught sight of old acquaintances and the matching of invitations. Are you going to the Ordways? the Herseys, the Schultzes, and the long green tickets clasped tight in our gloved hands. And last, the murky yellow cars of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad, looking cheerful as Christmas itself on the tracks beside the gate. When we pulled out into the winter night and the real snow, our snow began to stretch out beside us and twinkle against the windows and the dim lights of small Wisconsin stations moved by. A sharp, wild brace came into the air. We drew in deep breaths of it as we walked back from dinner through the cold vestibules, unutterably aware of our identity with this country for one strange hour before we melted indistinguishably into it again. That's my Middle West, not the wheat or the prairies or the lost Swede towns, 
but the thrilling returning trains of my youth and the street lamps and sleigh bells in the frosty dark and the shadows of holly wreaths thrown by lighted windows on the snow. Ready for the holidays, aren't you? <laughs> and I, I'll give Fitzgerald the last word about Gatsby because that is only fitting on his birthday or any day. As he wrote to Patsby McCormick a month before Gatsby's publication day in 1925, quote, Gatsby was far from perfect in many ways, but all in all, it contains such prose as has never been written in America before. From that, I take heart. From that, I take heart, close quote. Happy birthday, dear Scott. Happy 100th year, dear Gatsby. And thank you all kindly. Thank you so, so very much. We do have time for questions. I've got a wireless mic here. I can um, work the room a little bit. And we also will take some questions from online. So if you're able to, please stick around and join us. So I'm wondering if you're going to the Turf Club tonight for the celebration of his 128th <laughs> birthday. <laughs> I think we should all go. <laughs> Um, Fitzgerald's major at Princeton, was that theater? Technically, it was English. Um, he, was, he was very interested in European history, in medieval history, which would manifest itself later in, in these Felipe stories that he wrote for Red Book that, to my knowledge, have not been republished, um, that are set in medieval France. But he, he was an English major, yeah. Yeah, hey, thanks for that great lecture. Uh, so much interesting factual information about our friend F. Scott. You, you kind of answered my original question at the end there, because I was going to ask what were some specific St. Paul references in the book. Well, that last description of that train ride, yeah, that's a, a great St. Paul uh, reference right there. I was wondering, in terms of selling the book, was he ever required to help promote it? Like, they didn't do book tours back then, right? I mean, uh, how would they engage Fitzgerald in the selling? I mean, I know he was written about, like, in gossip pages or anything, but did he ever yeah, have that, to do interviews or anything? That was, that was a, big, a big selling point. He did do readings um, when he was in New York which often he wasn't, and he wasn't there for Gatsby, of course. But he did do a reading, uh, he, he did several readings for This Side of Paradise, where people you know, came out to see him like a, like a pop star, basically. And the other poor people he was doing reading with were kind of ignored. Um, there's reviews that you can find in the New York papers of these readings. And Scribner really used his face, his image, you know, this beautiful young writer, in so many different uh, advertisements. Um, blurbs in newspapers were used to sell it. Of course, the Scribner's windows and displays they sent to bookstores were designed to, to amp up sales as well. Um, I don't know about radio ads, interestingly, because so little canned radio broadcasts survive. I'm not sure how advertising worked on the radio, but there's nothing I can think of particularly. Um, Fitzgerald did keep scrapbooks throughout his life. Um, his mother kept a baby book when he was a baby. Uh, then he kept scrapbooks for all of his collections of short stories, for the silent films that were made from some of his short stories, like Head and Shoulders. And then he kept a scrapbook for every novel. The book plate that you see behind me of the dancing skeleton, the jazz age skeleton, Be Your Age, was a suggested book plate that was done for him in 1925, right after Gatsby came out, in a new magazine called The New Yorker. And Herb Roth is the artist. He did one for Shakespeare, you know, several other authors. But the Fitzgerald one was one of his earliest ones. 
And Fitzgerald thought this pegged the spirit of Gatsby so well that he cut this out of the New Yorker and he pasted it in his Gatsby scrapbook as the book plate. Um, these scrapbooks are full of advertisements for his novels. And there's kind of an infamous one. I think it's after The Beautiful and Damned came out. And uh, they've got the picture of, you know, beautiful young Scott, an engraving of Scott, and then lists of his, lists of his Scribner short story collections and his books. And then it says in big letters, make it a Fitzgerald Christmas with an exclamation point. And Fitzgerald has clipped this out and put it in his scrapbook. And next to it, he's written in pencil, my God, with an exclamation point. <laughs> so, um, you know, Scribner were his publisher throughout his lifetime. They also published Zelda's uh, Save Me the Waltz. And they were and remain um, one of America's leading, most historic, and most highly regarded publishers. So they certainly put, and Charles Scribner liked Fitzgerald and liked his work, as did Perkins, so they put, they put a big push behind him that, uh, that really helped sustain his popularity then and now. All this talk about uh, the, the advertising, it, uh, of course, the, the book jackets themselves are sure. advertising. And, and, uh, and I wonder if, uh, if he had any relationship with any of the artists that uh, made those beautiful images. Mm. Yeah, he, he really liked this particular cover. Um, the cover for the vegetable, his flop play, the cover for the vegetable was done by John Held. And he loved loved that cover. Um, he admired Held, he really liked his Jazz Age drawings and also some of his Grimmer cartoons uh, in The New Yorker. And he was very fond of that cover in particular. The one that's the cipher, the one that, that fascinates and haunts me is the cover for Tender is the Night, which is a glorious cover. It's a scene of, um, I'm I'm working now on on the authorized uh, on an authorized edition, thanks to the trustees of the Fitzgerald Estate, of Zelda's selected letters. There's a postcard that Zelda sent from the Riviera to her parents in Montgomery, Alabama, that features almost exactly the same angle, the same scene as the cover of Tender Is the Night, that lovely colored cover. Um, we have no idea who did the dust jacket. We don't know the name of the artist. We don't know where the surviving art, if it survives, is. It's, it's a great mystery. And I would love to know not only who did it, but what Fitzgerald thought of it, because it's so perfect for that book. Uh, first, thank you for being here. Really enjoyed the lecture. Complete pleasure. Thank um, you. I'm a little confused with the, the copy that I could buy in the bookstore right now, which edition is that? Is that the definitive edition, the way Fitzgerald wanted? If he still lived, he would still be revising, is the sense I get. <laughs> I have a feeling that he might. He, he, might have, he might have settled down after 120, well, it hasn't been 128 years, after 100 years. Um, he might have settled into, into a groove and been happy that people like it the way it is. Um, when the first edition came out, I mentioned that he had a copy of the first edition, first printing, that he wrote in the front, like, don't borrow, don't take, this is mine. And he went through and made a number of penciled changes himself. All those changes are now incorporated in what, with the collapse or the lapse of its copyright, is called the, you're holding it right there, um, the Scribner uh, edition of Gatsby. Those are all incorporated in the Scribner edition and have been since the second edition. So that is the way he wanted it to be. I, as, as far as any more changes, I don't know of any changes. I mean, I mean, it's hard to tell from that exactly when he made the changes. They're not dated, but they're in his handwriting. And I assume that he made them shortly after publication. I don't know of any instances, let's say, in 1938 or 39 when he was in Hollywood, 
uh, I can't think of a letter, let's say, that he wrote to Max Perkins saying, I really should have changed this particular line. Um, you know, and, and then that would be, should that change be made or not? That would be an editorial decision at this point. But I think the, the you know, there are many editions of Gatsby now and many, I guess, the word I, that leaps to mind is perversions of Gatsby. About a week after the copyright expired, I received for review a copy of something that was The Great Gatsby with Vampires. Where, where Gatsby himself is a vampire and Nick Carraway is kind of a vampire hunter figure. And I, I, I didn't review it. Um, but, you know, and it, it tracked the language of the novel with just a few changes to make it vampiric. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know really where to put things like that. Um, I appreciate a creative project as well as the next person. I would love to see an epic poem um, based on Gatsby, for instance, if people still wrote epic poems. Um, but, uh, but of these musicals, I completely recommend that you go see The, uh, the American Myth, the Florence Welch uh, Gatsby, and go see Gats as many times as you can sit there for eight hours in a stretch. <laughs> Hi, we have one question from Jim online. Jim says, Jay Gatsby's to-do list and Ben Franklin. What are your thoughts? Ah, <laughs> oh, what are my thoughts? Um, Jay Gatsby's to-do list. Uh, this is the list that young Jimmy Gatz wrote in the back of his copy of Topple on Cassidy, isn't it? Yeah, where things like no more smoking and chewing, um, save a particular amount of money crossed out, be better to parents, um, improving things and exercises. Uh, yeah, I mean, Ben Franklin was, was I guess, in, in Americana terms, if that's the right phrase, the parent and original of those kind of informational, uh, poor Richard Z. almanac -y suggestions as to how to live your life and how to lead your life. Um, Franklin may figure in there. I think more importantly is somebody who Fitzgerald was obsessively reading during that last summer he was out at White Bear Lake, and that's Mark Twain. I think uh, he, was, he was quoting Twain in letters. He was talking about things he was immersed in reading and rereading. And I think some of Twain's kind of didactic, um, you know, informational things for boys, particularly boys like Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, um, I think those, those wended their way into, into Jimmy Gatz's uh, childhood list, boyhood list. Hi, thank you for doing this. This is a fantastic presentation. Um, a kind of, it's really, it's good timing that you just brought up Twain because the question I had was when you were talking about him um, conceiving of starting this third novel and he, how he wanted to make it Catholic and about the Midwest, and then you kind of said he went away from that. Uh, I kind of would, between your last quote and talking about him reading Twain, I would contend that this is an extremely Midwestern novel, just kind of setting yeah. up in reflection against yes he yes even Thank though you. even though it is chiefly set in new york city in a sweltering hot summer and out on what he called that long shrill island um out on long island um it's it's absolutely midwestern after the passage i read you uh, about the thrilling returning trains and the holly wreaths he goes on to say i see that all along this has been a novel of the midwest and he he lists the characters, all of whom are Midwesterners, um, with the notable exceptions of George and Myrtle Wilson, who indeed, uh, when George finds out she's having an affair, he tells Tom Buchanan at the gas pump that they're going away, that they're going west, right? that they're gonna get out of there. And she's, she's from the area. Um, if you think of Myrtle and her sister, you know, they've, they've grown up in, if not in Queens, certainly in the New York area. But that's an interesting comment also on that as to, and of course, Nick goes back, um, goes back home 
at the end of the novel, or at least he's announced his intention to do so. And that's one thing I think Lerman's novel, uh, Lerman's film, does really interestingly as an interpretation of the novel is to have Nick, you know, coming out of what's clearly a sanitarium of some kind in the Midwest, having gone back to what at the beginning, after having been to war for four years, he regards as the ragged edge of the universe. But it's now become a place of safety and security for him. Um, it's it's pretty much the Catholic element that he that he has downplayed. There are some notable mentions of Catholicism, of course, in Gatsby. The leading one being. Uh, at the party at Tom and Myrtle's love nest where the excuse Myrtle has been given for Tom not leaving Daisy is that his wife is a devout Catholic, that Daisy is a devout Catholic and Tom can't leave the marriage. Nick's internal comment at this point is, you know, Daisy is not, was not a Catholic and I was a little shocked by the elaborateness of this, but as usual, Nick says nothing. Hi, I really enjoyed the Hi, talk Rick. and um, talking about the the book cover for Gatsby mm. um, reminded me that I know he was, I mean, he was always very involved in his book covers and kind of the planning and promotion of his books. I know he for Gatsby, he, did, he specifically wanted there to be no blurbs on it, yeah. on the dust jacket, and I think that's very... Um, it just kind of speaks to his intention that, you know, he wanted the novel to really speak for itself. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That's a great point. He certainly did. And uh, you know, when they when they pulled review quotes for the second edition, he he never he was never really fond of that. He he liked his work to stand alone. And here we are, a hundred years later, and it does. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and and just one other quick thing. Yeah. Um, and also that, that Gatsby was not serialized yeah. um, before publication. And he, although he got an offer from the magazine College Humor mm -hmm. and for something like $10,000, I think, you know, which was a good chunk of money. But he, and he says, I think it's to Perkins, he says, you know, I didn't want to do it with College Humor because they would have thought Gatsby was a great halfback. <laughs> like, that's, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, he was, and, and at, at uh, Ober felt that at 218 pages, it was too short to serialize, really, too. So there was that, yeah. I found the letter from to Patsby, Patsby. Um, fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I want to know a little bit more about that correspondence. Is that at Princeton or? It's at Princeton, yes. It's in the Fitzgerald Papers. And it is, um, you know, th there's very little of it. I've, I've looked up Hazel McCormick. I've tried to find out more about her. I think that's a wonderful project for somebody. Um, I have not actually been able to find out that much about her and about her career. She was, she was very keen on becoming a writer. She didn't publish very much. Um, and they did not maintain or sustain a long correspondence. But what there is, I'm really glad we have. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. I am curious about what you um, commented about Fitzgerald's concern that the book wouldn't be commercially successful because it didn't feature strong women characters. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of contemporaries of the time. I mean, you mentioned Cather, but like Hemingway was not featuring strong female characters. I'm trying to like find the context where, was this a valid concern in yes. 1925? So yes. what, what was, um, can you give a little more landscape sure. around that? Uh, most of the people buying books, buying novels and reading novels, the, the lion's share of readers at that point in time were women and Two words, Edith Wharton, um, a woman who Fitzgerald was so nervous <laughs> upon meeting that he had a fair amount to drink before he arrived. And then afterwards, um, she bore him no ill will. She'd seen everything by then. And she was kind of charmed by him, a couple of letters would suggest. But, um, you know, the age of innocence is 
1921, right? Isn't that the year it wins the Pulitzer Prize? And, and that's right after, that's actually after the side of paradise <laughs> that you have this incredibly crafted novel, this beautiful novel featuring certainly strong women characters, you know, May Welland may be light and slight and delicate and girlish, but when, when she drops that line about May Welland Archer at that point and her eyes that are wet with not tears, but victory, <laughs> there's, you know, that's a line to have written, um, and that's a, that's a remarkable novel to have written. So Fitzgerald was highly aware of the competition from not just Cather, but, but other novelists creating really strong female characters. And uh, 1922, Ulysses, with the character of Molly Bloom, um, a writer Fitzgerald desperately admired, William Faulkner, publishing um, novels with some significantly powerful and engaging, difficult female characters. So, so yeah, he was, um, I think he was right to be worried about it. I don't know. I go back and forth on who the strongest female character is in The Great Gatsby. Um, and it's interesting to me that with the expiration of copyright, some of the most interesting projects that have come out of it are novels that do feature and showcase the women. Um, I, was, I was fond of one that uh, focused on Pammy Buchanan. Like, what did she grow up to be? What was her life like? You know, it's interesting to contemplate if you can bear to. <laughs> Thank you all so much. As we wrap up tonight, am I still on here? Um, thank you all so, so very much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. That was really an amazing presentation and the discussion. So thank you all here in the room again and those of you online who are taking part in tonight's event. So I would like to also thank the team at SPNN who was responsible for the filming and the live streaming. We couldn't do it without you. And Murray, thank you very much for your help as well, um, monitoring our online questions and the slideshow. If you enjoyed this, then you're gonna love what 2025 will bring. So all through the year, the Friends will serve as a resource and a partner with community organizations and individuals to produce discussions, exhibits, performances, readings, and more for Gatsby at 100. You can find all of the information that we have right now on our website at thefriends.org slash Gatsby. And then we will be adding um, more events and programs as they happen throughout the year. So that can be your resource. Um, Dr. Daniel has promised us a list of um, work that has been inspired by The Great Gatsby. So we'll put that resource there as well. And be sure that you sign up for our e-news at thefriends.org. When you're visiting that list of events, you can find out more about our programming and the work that we do to support the St. Paul Public Library. And finally, if you can't wait for uh, January for more Fitzgerald fun, then we also partner with the writer, showman, and Fitzgerald enthusiast Danny Klecko on discussions of Fitzgerald's short stories. So the next event in that ongoing series will take place on Thursday, October 17th at the Miriam Park Library. So thank you all again, and good night. Thank you.